America already has 500 F 35s. 500? Compared to the tiny squadron of more modern fighters that Russia has at its disposal. There's no In use air, in saying that something is better USA. if that something Not barely possible. exists. Hey guys, it's Loud Guys! Today we are going to watch Could the US Defeat Russia on its own? And this is a very big question because what we have seen is like first we thought that okay Ukraine will not be able to fight Russia. But then we saw that American weapons and everything was coming in. Ukraine was very 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 ably able to fight Russia and we thought that Russia will back down because of all the sanctions and everything that was happening around it. But then what we saw that Russia is also not backing down and Russia has also made all the other kind of you know economies to sustain itself like it is not sustaining on the US dollar and everything. So which just shows that Russia is also a very big superpower and we might just be you know hidden by the fact that how much money and how much resources Russia has and even in the Cold War era we saw that how Russia was very very powerful like that is why America was able to do such an hold off and everything so we will see in this video like could the US defeat Russia on its own and you know like if as far as India is concerned India is also a very big ally of Russia also India is mm -hmm. an ally of US also but India is also ally of Russia because I remember like when Ukraine wanted every country to like treat Russia very badly and asked Russia to give up. So India did not do that. India was like, okay, end the war, but like we are not going against Russia categorically. Mm -hmm. So even US had problems with India that why aren't you saying that Russia is bad and this and this. But India was like, no, we are not going to do this because Russia has always been our friend in 70s and 60s and always be, be, it has always been our friend. So we cannot like do that to it. So because of it, Russia is also helping us a lot. So it, this video will be very interesting because uh, like it will be US versus Russia all alone. Um, according to me, um, this question always arose in my mind that why they are not, you know, try to stop the war. You know, they are supplying the weapons. It's like kind of motivation to them that we are supplying your weapons. Mm. You can just carry on the war. Yeah. For me, I think they should, you know, uh, separate the step to just stop that war. Yeah. What do you I think? Yes, of course, you, you are right about it. But the thing is, they will say that, okay, because Russia is attacking, that is why we are supplying the weapon. Uh -huh. So they will mm -hmm. give the reason that because mm -hmm. he is beating me, that is why I am beating him. For yeah. me, you know, what I consider everything is business. Yeah, it is. It is. It is a very big business thing. So let's see what is there in this video. The United States would absolutely decimate Russia if war broke out between the two nations. Oh. That's the opinion of David Petraeus a former CIA director and four-star army general who says that Russia launching a nuke in Ukraine would lead to the US stomping Putin into submission. Yeah. But there's a caveat to that claim. Petraeus says that the US would lead NATO in a collective takedown of every conventional Russian force, mm. from battlefield equipment to naval, that is stationed in or around Ukraine. What he doesn't say is that if it was a one-on-one -on -one fight between Russia and the US, with all of their individual forces mm, focused solely one on, on each one. other, that America would come out on top. Would it though? That's an interesting question, as the world's two largest superpowers colliding would inevitably lead to a world war that involves almost yes. every ally that either country could muster. But if we could Ooh, create India a support. hypothetical battlefield mm. in which the two countries I fight alone, one. would the US have what it takes to defeat Russia? Or does Putin have enough tricks up his sleeve to take on America? Let's find out, starting with the most obvious point, the size of each country's military. According to Global Firepower, the US and Russia rank as numbers 1 and 2 respectively in terms of the sheer size of their militaries. Starting with the United States, it has 1.832 million military personnel, mm. 1.39 million of whom are on active duty and not part of volatile paramilitary groups. Oh, the vast wow. majority of that military is focused on the ground-based army which boasts a little over 1 million members spread across active and reserve duty. But the Air Force and US Navy are no slouches, with yes. both having hundreds of thousands of members. The US also has a ton of equipment. A staggering 13,300 aircraft, 14, with 9,975 of those being combat ready, join wow. 5,500 tanks and over 300,000 vehicles, along with impressive stocks of artillery. On the naval side, the US has 484 assets, including nearly a dozen aircraft carriers and 92 destroyers. It has nuclear-capable submarines too, making its naval fleet a terrifying force, wow. both on the surface and below it. These are amazing numbers, mm. but Russia isn't too far behind. Global Firepower points out that it has 1.33 million military personnel, with 830,900 on, on active mm. duty. America. 
That leaves 250,000 as reserves, and a similar number in paramilitary groups, such as the infamous Wagner Group, that Moscow oh. essentially controls. In the air, Wagner. Russia does seem to fall behind substantially. It has 4,182 aircraft, 11, of which global firepower estimates around 2,000 are combat ready. And the Russian Air Space Force, VKS, has a few hundred thousand fewer members. Russia also has less military vehicles, 151,000 to America's 300,000, though it comes out on top with tanks, as it has more than double what the US boasts. Ooh. Its navy is bigger too. Russia has 598 assets that it can call on, though the spread of those assets Russia differs has a from bigger the United navy. States. It only has one aircraft carrier, oh, for instance, oh, and a comparatively yeah. paltry 15 destroyers to compared 11. to America's 92. Submarine numbers are about level, though America wins out for nuclear capabilities. Hmm. But Russia has impressive numbers of corvettes and is likely more capable than the US when it comes to conducting mine warfare. Ooh. If war were won on pure numbers alone, the US would be the clear victor. Yes. It has more of almost everything from personnel to equipment, hmm. and even in the naval area, where it lags behind, you could argue that America's focus on more attacking vessels gives it an advantage. But sheer numbers alone don't win wars. Yeah. Both the US and Russia can tell you that. Mm. They have each found it difficult to win wars against much smaller countries, mm. as we saw clearly in Vietnam and are currently seeing in Ukraine. So pure military might isn't the measuring stick for a... And also, also what I feel is like, because what will happen is if uh, there is a war between Russia and USA, so it will never be a one-to-one. -one. It will always be like Europe will be helping USA and China will be helping Russia. You know, whole world be, will be divided between the two countries, huh. I feel. And I feel India will not be joining any party. But India is in the middle. <laughs> huh, but India will be forced to join. Like if, if like they support Pakistan huh. and if Pakistan attacks India, then India will be forced to attack Pakistan and then India will join the whole world hmm. war. But other than that, India will try to stay neutral. I don't neutral. want to... You know, happen this because this is a total destruction of the whole world. Yes, and that's how it will go. So this is a very complicated thing if US and Russia go into a war. Conflict between the two. We have to dig deeper. Starting with the ground game, both have similar ground force setups. For the US, its infantry squads form the backbone of its armed forces, with its light infantry being divided into air assault, mountain and airborne units. Each light infantry squad consists of nine soldiers, divided into a squad leader and a pair of fire teams. Oh. Each of those fire teams has a lead, an automatic rifleman, typically carrying M4 carbines and an M249 automatic weapon, a grenadier and a rifleman. Soldiers may also receive AT4 anti-tank weapons if the situation calls for it. Wow. Mechanize one of those infantry units and you see the addition of both the Striker and M2 Bradley fighting vehicles. Most interesting here is the new generation of Strikers, which come equipped with either a powerful 30mm cannon or the United States' ace in the hole, the Javelin anti-tank missile. Ooh. That missile gives the US a mid-range option for taking out tanks that could prove especially useful given Russia's reliance on them as combat vehicles. Russia's equivalent of America's mechanized squads is its motor rifle team, which will typically come equipped with either a BMP-23 or BTR-82A combat vehicle. Those vehicles have seven-man dismount teams, all nice. armed with a pair of PKM machine guns, an AK-74M rifle, really hard to and a short-range RPG-16 anti-tank weapon. Those PKMs are starting to get a little dated, though Russia is in the process of switching them out for the updated PKP. However, PKP. the motor rifle teams PKP. lack a comparable anti-tank weapon to the Javelin, giving the US a slight advantage in that area that would otherwise be more or less equal. However, Russia does come out on top in terms of the sheer number of infantry it can field compared to the United States. More its infantry contains a trio of vehicle platoons, including an extremely mobile airborne unit that enables it to field about 25% more soldiers than the US Army, oh, according wow. to the national interest. Theoretically, that gives Russia more tactical mobility on the ground, especially compared to America's light infantry that is marching on foot. Russia can reach objectives faster and deploy more people when it gets there. That but that scary. increased deployment isn't all it's cracked up to be. When Russia loses one of its vehicles, it loses about a third of its combat power that's built into each of its squads. By contrast, the US loses about a quarter because it has so many infantry members already on the ground. Combine that with the Bradley's better armor and superior firepower compared to Russia's BMP, and you have another slight edge for the US. Throw the Javelin into the mix 
and the US has more than enough firepower to take on Russia's superior deployment capabilities. Wow. Of course, there are caveats on both sides. The first is that neither country's infantry would fight alone. The mm. battle wouldn't be a case of stacking infantry units against one yes, another. That's Mortars, what we're, air we're support, talking about, artillery, like, and so much more be would be added to the support, mix, meaning that ground-based battles would be determined as much by tactical nous as and pure firepower. Very far away from Terrain each other. is the second caveat, with Russia's effectiveness potentially being curtailed if battles were fought on terrain that favors foot soldiers, mm. given its heavy reliance on vehicles. However, you could also argue that Russia would have the advantage if ground battles were fought in colder climates. Yes. And of course, each would have a home field advantage of knowing their territory if the war encroached into their own country. So there are factors at play beyond firepower. Though the US likely comes out on top in a ground war, it's better equipped and has more infantry, mm. even if Russia has superior deployment. But I think we see a similar story Russia, when Russia the battle would... takes to the skies. Definitely. Here, the US has a clear advantage yeah, for the, the simple sky, fact that each country uses its air force differently. Russia tends to focus on small-scale operations well, with its air force. Mm. It typically uses its planes to offer support to its ground troops, with bombing runs tending to be conducted at low altitudes. Oh. That approach creates a great risk of planes being shot down by anti-air artillery, as we've seen to great effect in the Ukraine war. According to the RAND Corporation, Moscow has lost between 84 and 130 of its aircraft by August damage. 2023, with the real number likely being higher. Oh. In fact, the same group says that Russia may have lost between 27 and 57 aircraft by simply pushing too many of its aging aircraft into longer service. Oh. Maintenance is almost as much of an issue as the caliber of its pilots and the and approach the it takes to aerial battles. By contrast, millions. the United States focuses on composite air operations, or COMEOs. This approach can bring anywhere between 20 and 100 aircraft into a single operation, usually taking place over a large geographical area to achieve an objective. Those craft will vary, with some providing reconnaissance and support, while others attack more directly, creating a multifaceted approach to air-based warfare that allows the US to not only cover large patches of land, but also fend off other aerial forces. Granted, Comeos often include aircraft from multiple countries this working together jet. to achieve a goal, but it's likely that the US would still employ this approach when fighting Russia on its own, especially given the sheer volume of superior equipment that it has. And equipment is another major wow. win for the US. Russia has a large number of Soviet-era aircraft, uh, including MiGs. its MiG-29s, yes. MiG-31s, and Su-27s. It also uses Su-30s, which were introduced in 1992, we also buy making them over 30 years old. Granted, these craft have generally been modernized as much as possible, making them capable of modern air-based warfare. But they're still old aircraft, with a lot of flight miles recorded and relatively few left in the tank. Of course, these aren't the only craft in Russia's lineup, as they also have the more modern MiG-35 and Su-35 fighters to call on. But neither yes. is as advanced as America's best fighters. And Russia's so, war in Ukraine has shown that it's yeah. increasingly reliant on older craft so to conduct its air operations. In comparison, the US largely uses the F-16 and A-10 fighter jets, which have been in operation for about 20 years. They're starting to show their age too, though they don't have as many miles on the clock as Russia's older stock of Soviet-era fighters. Mm. However, it's in the process of introducing the F-35A oh, Lightning II wow. into its fleet, a fifth-generation fighter jet the F-35A would likely be the trump card that America could deploy in an air battle that it should already dominate simply thanks to its superior tactics. And we saw so the battle on the ground is fairly are. even, but the battle in the skies should be in favor of the United States. That was even pointed out in 2020 by a Russian tech billionaire named Mikhail Bolshakov. In an article published on the Russian news website Vuzgliad, he pointed out that Russia does have the Su-57, which it claims is superior to anything that America has to offer. But where production of the Su-57 is faltering, at best, America already has 500 F-35s, compared to the tiny squadron of more modern fighters that Russia has at its disposal. There's no in use air, in saying that something is better USA. if that something Not barely possible. exists. For the United States, it could assume that Russia would deploy similar air tactics to those in Ukraine, mm. and those tactics would represent opportunities given the wealth of anti-aircraft options that the US has that compared to the soldiers on the ground in Kyiv. Mm. The US is looking pretty good so far, but the battle may start to turn in Russia's favor once the Navy comes into Navy. play. After all, global firepower's figures from earlier show that Russia's Navy is larger than America's. Though the US is no slouch, 
Yes, it has fewer naval assets, but those assets tend toward being more combat focused than those deployed by the Russians. Still, you can't underestimate Russia's capabilities in this area. Yes, its navy focuses primarily on smaller patrol boats and corvettes, neither of which present much of a threat to America in yeah. a blue water scenario. The deeper you go into the sea, the more America has the advantage simply because of the strength of its destroyers. Mm. However, Russia could play a different naval game. While using some of its large ships and submarines to distract America's bigger combat vessels in deep water, it could deploy its smaller vessels to coastal regions. Oh, that would yeah. be a problem. Corvettes and patrol vehicles are capable of attacking ports and launching smaller attacks, especially once they've drawn in close to a target. They're also more agile than the larger but destroyers, meaning they present a clear threat to commercial mm -hmm. vessels that aren't equipped but to fend off attacks from any type of ship. Water. And though the Pacific Ocean would be a huge barrier to these small ships, Russia's proximity to Alaska, its Providenia port is just 250 miles away, mm -hmm. could prove a route in. Attack Alaska, establish it as a naval base, and launch from there. Yes. Of course, the US would have something to say about this approach. While that proximity is an issue, it would also create a bottleneck if Russia relied on it alone to get its ship closer to the United States. Its smaller what vessels would ship? be sitting ducks for America's fleet of destroyers as they cross the Bering Strait. So that would be unlikely to happen. And according to Marine Insight, there's a good reason why. As with its air force, Russia takes a different approach to the United States with its naval forces. Russia is all about strategic deterrence. It uses its navy primarily to keep others away from Russian territory oh. rather than to actively attack in deeper seas. So That's not to say it's incapable of blue water combat. It's just not as capable as the US, which would make using its navy to prevent America from landing in Russia via sea a smarter strategy. The United States, by contrast, relies on power projection and is much more likely to deploy its navy into deep waters to combat Russia. Mm. It could also use its fleet as launching points for the Air Force's Comeo attacks. Get one of its dozen or so aircraft carriers in close, and American fighter pilots could also, take America to the skies to attack Russian ports or even conduct simple reconnaissance. The only area where the two countries are approximately equal is in mm, nuclear-powered submarine yeah. capabilities, and it's here that Russia could claw back some ground According to Newsweek, Putin has been improving Russia's underwater capabilities for years, with the crown jewels of that fleet being the Imperator Alexander III and the Krasnoyarsk. The former is capable of carrying up to 16 of Russia's Bulava Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles ICBMs, giving it the ability to launch heavy attacks from deep waters onto US territory. Putin has been bullish about his subs too, having said in December, that he'll be commissioning more nuclear submarines in the future to ensure Russia's security for decades to come. Of course, wow. the US is no slouch in the nuclear submarine department. All four of its main operation classes of subs, the Virginia, yes, Ohio, Virginia, Los Ohio, Angeles, and Seawolf, are all nuclear powered. And in oh. the case of the Ohio class, the US has 14 submarines that are capable of launching ICBMs of their own, according to the ICBMs. Nuclear Threat Initiative. So a naval battle between Russia and the US might come down to where that battle takes place. Deep sea battles seem to favor the US, where more coastal conflicts may be the domain of Russia. Mm. Still, the US might have a slight advantage here, simply because it has more aircraft carriers, creating the possibility of better cooperation between its navy and air force. But none of that matters if either country runs out of arms. Assuming the battle between the US and Russia becomes a war of attrition, which is likely, barring one potential outcome that we'll get to in a moment, keeping troops stocked up will be essential. Every destroyed vehicle, sunken ship, and destroyed fighter plane will take its toll, with near-constant military yes. production likely being essential. Not to mention all the American ammunition and small that. arms that would be needed for ground They're combat. Very big right now, the US stands players. apart in the arms production race, yeah. at least in terms of producing weapons for other countries. Lockheed According Martin, to Axiom, the US produced 40% of the world's arms exports between 2018 40%. and 2022, in addition uh, to keeping its own military well stocked. That's leagues ahead of Russia. Though still in second place, it only accounted for 16% of exports during the same period. Of course, the caveat to these figures is that Russia is engaged in a war with Ukraine right now. America it's not selling as many weapons now. because its mm -hmm. own forces need them weapons. to fight that war, so it's no shock that the US has leaped further ahead. But further is the key term here. Even before the war in Ukraine, the United States sold and produced more weapons. Oh. Between 2013 and 17, the US accounted for 33% of all weapons exports, with 33. Russia hitting 22%. 
closer for sure, was closer. but there was still a considerable gap there. Uh. It's an inexact measure of production capacity. And it's not like Russia doesn't have the ability to ramp up when it needs to. As recently as September 2023, Reuters reported that Putin has ordered a cranking up of production to keep Russian troops well equipped, even in the face of increasingly strict sanctions being placed on Moscow. Oh. According to Bekan Ozdoev, who is the industrial director of Rostec, which manufactures most of the country's weapons, production of various types of weapons has increased to between two and ten times previous numbers. Wow. He also pointed to increased production of tanks, rocket launchers, artillery, and ballistic missiles, all of which should be harder to produce given the sanctions placed on Rostec. Even the United States Treasury recognizes how important Rostec is to Russia, dubbing it the cornerstone of Russia's defense, industrial, technological, and manufacturing sectors. With Rostec firing on all cylinders, Russia would be able to keep pumping out weapons simply because it's a state-controlled corporation that Moscow ultimately controls. The US doesn't have that luxury. Its weapons come from private companies that yes, are under government boy. contracts. If Russia were to really fire on all cylinders with its weapon production, could the US match it, or would it get wrapped up in bureaucratic red tape and contract negotiations that could delay its weapons production? It's hard to say. But ultimately, the production lines won't matter if either country launches the biggest weapons in their arsenal, nuclear the nukes. Russia oh. and the US lead the way in nuclear We'd weapons, never want it's that. not even close. Never. According to the Arms Control Association, ACA, Russia has an estimated 5,889 nukes to wow. America's 5,244. Oh, Russia has more! Edge. Of those nukes, Russia has strategically deployed 1,549 of them while the United States has 1,410 ready to go. The reality is that Russia having a slight edge in numbers here is ultimately like meaningless. Both countries I have more than enough thing. nuclear weapons to destroy the other many times over, meaning mutually assured destruction would come to fruition if either was brave or stupid enough to launch. Still, there is an element that might tip the balance in Russia's favor from the nuclear perspective, the RS-28 Sarmat. Dubbed the Satan II by some military experts, the Sarmat missile system entered combat duty in September 2023 and can launch nuclear warheads further than any ICBM of its kind. Its range is somewhere in the 11,000 mile region, with Moscow claiming that each missile can carry 15 warheads. Washington disputes that. It claims the number is closer to 10. But it's the range that's the really worrying part. Wow. Russia can launch a nuke from, from inside almost anywhere Russia to and USA's hit the US. end point. America doesn't have that capability. East its closest coast. equivalent to the Sarmat, the I'm Minuteman 3, can game. travel up to 8,000 mm. miles, according to the National Air and Space Museum. Impressive for sure, and far enough to reach Russia, but the ICBM is outdated compared to the Sarmat. Furthermore, the US Naval Institute reports that America has only tested the Minuteman 3's range up to 6,000 miles, meaning 8,000 may be a stretch for the aging ICBM. Oh, even the Minuteman 3's even intended replacement hmm. doesn't outperform the Sarmat when it comes to sheer range. The upcoming LGM 35A Sentinel isn't complete yet, so its specifications aren't public knowledge. However, Air Force technology estimates that the ICBM is expected to have a range exceeding 5,500 kilometers, which is about 3,400 miles. That's less distance than the Miniman 3 and about a third of the range of the Sarmat, which would put the US at a nuclear disadvantage. Yes. The caveat here is that exceeding 5,500 kilometers could mean that the Sentinel could go much further. We just don't know yet. The key is that Russia can now fire from land almost anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and hit the US with a nuke. Of course, America's air and nuclear submarine options mean it could launch a counterattack at any time, potentially oh, making yes. the point moot. The only thing for sure is oh. that if one country went down the nuclear route, the other would be far want behind. To see that. The entire world would so suffer the consequences. With nukes in play, the battle between the US and Russia could come down to which is willing to fire first. Mm. But if we take nuclear weapons out of the equation, it's clear that the US, by and large, has the advantage. Mm. It has more troops, more equipment, and a far more advanced air force that is not only tactically superior, but equipped with better aircraft. On the naval front, the battle is a little more even. Though the US has a stronger attacking force, particularly in deep waters, the smaller boats in the Russian fleet granted more mobility in coastal areas. I think so. We also knew the answer that US can defeat it, but 
we never want to see so this war a, for me there's a probability because if they are on their own both of the countries like hmm. their aggression and i cannot say that us will win definitely and also like russia is also very powerful and and we all it is never one on one it is always like this country is helping that this and that it will just be us and russia fight there is a world huge war. destruction over world is over yes and like everything we see that is beautiful we just go away because mm. that that's how scary it was during the cold war also mm. so we never want to see that so even we don't want to see the russia ukraine war no no because no. that is also going for too long it's about one or two years i think so it is still going on and on we are not hearing the end of it i think so something has to come people has to come together i'm tired of the wars and this and i don't like like you should, united nations united nations is there uh-huh. they should come and stop the war they should be like what russia wants what ukraine wants just come on to a path uh-huh. and like do it like there's no point in extending it it's very very bad for the country so what do you guys think about it do let us know in the comment section below so do like share and subscribe bye, bye.